Call to action and final exam was today. That's the only real concern. Um, again, we've talked about this every time, but this really is the foundational statement of everything we've talked about in this class. We've talked about stewardship. The conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. The idea of being manager, you know, quite often, usually, the manager is not the owner. And that's very much the situation we find ourselves in. We are given by God the responsibility to be the managers or stewards of everything that he has provided to us. And it is based upon the fundamental principle that it all belongs to God. He made it. He still owns it. He has given it to us for our benefit and use and enjoyment. Scripture talks about that God wants us to enjoy. But also that we would use it wisely in his service and to the to the extolling of his name. Right? Um, the thing, the mistake a lot of people make is they think of stewardship as being what you do with your money. You know, the stewardship sermon is the talk about giving. When in fact we are called to whole life stewardship, which means we must see everything in our lives as the things that we have an obligation to be good stewards over. Everything, every aspect of our lives. Money, material possessions, or what we call tangible uh, properties, are just one small part of it. Our very lives, given by God and, and got owned by God, God has a claim to us. Even our very lives, we have a responsibility to use them in God's service, to be good stewards of those things. So when we ask the question, how should we then live, the sort of, those of you who are in the philosophy class will understand kind of a logical uh, progression, a logic, logical argument. We believe everything is created by God. In addition to being the creator, God also paid a great price in Jesus to redeem the world from its own sin. Now, redemption was offered to the world, not all accepted. So it's not that Jesus' sacrifice means everybody's okay, but the, the gift was given. Um, everything, because God made it, because God redeemed it, everything therefore belongs to God. Anything we have or ever will have is given to us for our use and our stewardship, but nothing ever really belongs to us. Therefore, if we're to be good stewards, the question we must ask of everything in our lives is, what does God want us to do with his stuff? How does the owner want us as the managers to run his business? And we always have to remember that we are part of his stuff. We are part of his enterprise that we have responsibility for, okay? So we talked about a number of different kinds of stewardship in this class. First, um, the call of God on our life. If God's objectives for his call on our lives can become our objectives, if we really accept as our goals what we discover are his goals for us, then our lives, we believe, and are convinced, and have evidence for, will be both more productive and fulfilling than we could ever imagine. Because that's why we're made. That's what we're made for. It is to be in a relationship with God, to serve Him, all of which means to be good stewards of what He has provided to us. Um, and I'm sorry that, that, because I always want to give Him credit for it, I'm sorry that Gene uh, Raymer's not here today because this is his quote, if you have a pulse, you have a purpose. God's call on our lives. God intends for us to be and to do certain things. So the question we have to ask ourselves when we talk about this first kind of stewardship, the stewardship of God's call on our lives, is what are you called to do? God has a plan for you. God is calling you to do something. It may be a call to be the best parent you can possibly be. Maybe a call to use some particular giftedness or skill that God has provided to you to the, to the service of others. Whatever it is, you need to ask yourself, and the point of this class has been to encourage us to ask ourselves in each of these kinds of stewardship, in this case, the stewardship of God's call in your life, what is God calling you to do? You need to be asking yourself that question and praying about it and seeking that call. Because he doesn't drop any of us into this life and then just expect us to coast. That's not the way he works. Okay? So that's stewardship of God's call. The second aspect we talked about is the stewardship of God's gift of vision. Now, God speaks to us, confirming our vision. Vision being the ability to see what may not yet exist as being the direction God wishes for us to go. That he wishes his kingdom to go. 
there are at least three primary ways that God provides us with vision. One, through the instruction and direction given to us in his word, the Bible. God, God can give us a vision for what is possible by telling us what he has already done in the past. The examples that are given in scripture, as well as the challenges for us to excel that are in scripture. Secondly, we, God confirms uh, his vision for us as we go and meet with him in prayer. Back to that thing about the best way to be able to discern what is right or wrong, and also to discern what God's will is in terms of a vision, is by being in a relationship with him. And that's particularly by prayer. Third, God confirms our vision as he guides us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our minds and hearts. So in the word, and our relationship with him through prayer, and in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God gives us, affirms in us, a vision for what he desires and what he would call us to. And those may be modest visions that you can be an example to your neighbor, be a service to, uh, a witness to, etc. It may be a great vision. Uh, youth, youth for Christ, you know, the vision that God gave Bill Bright was to reach the world for Christ by the year 2000. Now, they didn't make it. But what they did do, what they did accomplish, the fruit of that vision that God gave Bill Bright 30 years ago, Bill Bright died two years ago, but um, the vision that he gave to Bill Bright and his wife to reach the, the world for Christ, you know, they have spread Campus Crusade, I said Youth for Christ, sorry, Campus Crusade is present all over the world. And so much was done because they had a giant vision. So whether your vision is an immediate localized neighborhood vision or it is a vision for the planet or something in between, God can give you a vision to accomplish his call and will in your life. So the question we ask is, what vision has God given to you? Vision and call obviously are linked to one another. What has God called you to do? What has God given you a vision for? All right? We need to ask ourselves that question. Third aspect of stewardship, we talked about our stewardship of faith. Basically, it's saying, what do we do with the faith that God gives us? Because faith is a gift from God. Faith is not something we muster up. Faith is given to us. So what are we supposed to do with it? Well, we've talked about in the lecture on this, receive it, hold on to it and be sure of it. Practice it, which means applying faith in practical ways to all aspects of life. To not have faith that something that things are going to work out all right, I'm not going to have enough money. You know, I'm not. I'm pretty sure I'm going to because of my parents, I'm going to be sick and dead by a certain age or whatever. The the negative side of not having faith that God's will will be done is that we're always worried about stuff. If you find yourself someone who worries about all those potential consequences all the time then you need to ask yourself, am I applying my faith? Am I practicing my faith in, in the, the real aspects of my life? We also, with our faith, need to be prepared to explain it and defend it. You know, in 2 Peter, be always prepared to give an explanation for the hope that is in you, but to do so with gentleness and respect. We need to be prepared to say to somebody, here's what I believe. Not, here's what you should believe, but here's what I believe. Here's what God has done for me. Here's what Jesus means to me. And here's why. A fifth thing is we need to be prepared to share it with others. Now, you may not be the sort of person that is, is you know, that God has gifted and called as an evangelist so that you're going to go knocking door to door, but there are opportunities for you to, you know, to simply answer questions. There are opportunities for you to be an example that will lead people to, to ask about those things. Um, so the question is, are you prepared to do something with your faith rather than just accept the faith as being the thing that caused you to accept and to be saved? Or are you going to do something with it? By the way, Bob, you reminded me of something, and I'm going to tell everybody. That sheet, the, the sign-in sheets are, sorry to change the subject here, the sign-in sheets are only for when you've been in this class. If, you, if you've taken... If you watch the videos and you've sent me the email and stuff, I keep record of that separately, and those two things will be put together in terms of the final record. So if you're, if you're looking at that and thinking, but I, but I sent him a message saying I watched that video, that's not reflected on there, okay? So. There's a couple of days that I, I was here that are. Okay. Uh, that reflects what I got. If for some reason you didn't check them, you can check them now. I trust you on that. Okay? 
taking them all <laughs> for everybody. Um, so, what are you prepared to do with the faith God has given you, other than just use it to accept Him and be saved with it? Which is kind of selfish if that's as far as we go. So, stewardship of faith. Next, we have stewardship of commitment. Commitment means having the determination to do what needs to be done, whatever the cost. Now, obviously, we're not called to be committed to being the richest person on the planet, and therefore would do anything as necessary. Commitment here, we're talking about commitment to God. And if God, if we are committed to God, and He has called us to do something, He's given us vision to do something, we have faith that He desires something for us, then we need to have the stick to itiveness commitment to follow through and to do what we're called to do. Now, commitment is the demonstration to ourselves as well as to everybody else that we trust in God and that we rely on Him. If we don't have any commitment, if we, you know, if we give up at the least pressure or opposition, if we don't follow through on things because it just, you know, uh, that's just too hard. If we don't have that level of commitment, then it demonstrates ultimately that we don't trust that God is serious about this stuff, or that we have to be serious about this stuff. And we identify four kinds of basic commitment that all of us are called to. Commitment to Christ, commitment to other people, meaning to serve them as Jesus served them. Commitment to prayer, which means to be in relationship with God on an ongoing basis. And a commitment to principles, meaning to try to live a righteous life. To seek to do what is good and right and moral in service, particularly. So, committed to Christ, committed to serve people and help meet their needs as Jesus did, commitment to prayer, which is a relationship with God, and commitment to principles of righteousness and goodness. So, we all have to ask ourselves the question, are, are you, are we, prepared to demonstrate your commitment to Christ? Are we willing to stick to it, to do what He's called us to do? Sometimes it's easy to say, I don't think I want to do this anymore. For me, that's like twice a day. Um, but we have to say, are we really committed in the way God wants us to be committed? Next, we talk about stewardship of time. The task that we have um, with regard to time is to figure out how best to use the time God has given us. We all have the same amount of time in every day. We don't all have the same number of years on earth. But with the time we have allotted to us, stewardship of time means to identify how we need to use time wisely, which means using time to live in a way that's pleasing to God and accomplishes His purposes. In other words, are we using our time to do what He desires for us, in us, and through us? Or am I just looking out for my own next buzz of whatever it is? The question then is, what is our source of satisfaction? You know, what is it that is going to make me feel satisfied? And most people, even many Christian people, get this wrong. They think it's by gaining wealth, or having a fulfilling relationship, or having a beautiful home, or being able to travel, those are all good things. And God wants us to benefit from good things. But that's not the thing that is going to make us, give us satisfaction. And if we spend our time pursuing all those things, instead of asking the question, how does God want me to spend my time, then we are not going to have the kind of depth in our lives that God wants for us to have. And that depth comes from us deciding we're going to spend our time on the things of God. So the question is, are you, are we prepared to use our time in ways that will please God and accomplish His will? Will we commit to that? The number of people who, um, and I think when we talked about time, I used, a, I used a chart that I found. The amount of time people spend watching television, listening to the radio, driving their car, you know, cooking, eating, etc. Bible study and prayer is like at the bottom of that 20 part list. So, one of the first things we need to do is to say, if, if I need to be a good steward of my time in order to please God and to, to do the things that He wants me to do with my time, having a better relationship with Him in terms of studying the Word and praying seems to be a good start. That's sort of square one in us doing a better job of using our time to the glory of God. So we have to say, are we prepared to use our time in ways that please God and accomplish His goals? His purposes, His will. We then talk about stewardship of opportunities. And we discuss the fact that we all have opportunities, but there's certain kind of opportunities that God places before all of us as Christians. 
he gives us opportunities to evangelize. And again, you may not be Billy Graham. You may not be somebody who is who has the spiritual gift of evangelism. I, I have the highest regard for Billy Graham, the greatest respect for him imaginable. He's not a very good preacher. Shock. His, his sermons are all pretty much the same. And they're very simple. They're very straightforward. And yet, when he preaches the Word of God, tens of thousands of people, many of whom would never have thought of it, except they got dragged there by the spouse or whatever, uh, come forward and commit their lives to Jesus. That's what the gift of evangelism is. It is not by his power, Billy Graham's power. It is not by, you know, the, the extraordinary gift he has of preaching. It's because God has uniquely gifted him in that. Now, you may not be Billy Graham. You may not have that, that kind of gift of evangelism. But somewhere, sometimes, someone in your life is going to ask you what you're for, what you're about. Are you prepared to share Jesus with them? Okay? We do get opportunities to tell about him. When Jesus said, go therefore into all the world, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What's the next thing he said? You remember? And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I think what Jesus was saying there is when it comes to the matter of telling other people about him, having them, helping them accept him, helping them become disciples, we're not doing that on our own. Jesus is there. I think that's why he said, and I am with you even to the very end of the age. You're not alone in this. And I believe that's one of the ways in which, you know, sort of the background material as to how it is God gives us the opportunity to evangelize. I'm not the greatest evangelist because unless I'm in a setting like this where I'm very comfortable, I, you know, I know what I'm about, I know who's there, I am not somebody who, you know, I'm not somebody who goes up and pecks somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, brother, are you ready for Jesus? Barry McGuire, you know the musician Barry McGuire? In the 60s, he, he had a hit song called Eve of Destruction. He talked about three-day parties twice a week. I love that line. Um, he became a Christian. And I one of the first, I heard it a couple times, one of the first Christian concerts I ever heard was Barry McGuire. And he said he was in San Francisco during the Jesus Freak Days. And that you always, when you're walking through San Francisco in those days, you always sort of would peek around the corner to make sure there weren't any Jesus freaks before you went around the corner. And he said one day, he and a friend of his were really stoned, and they were going to see um, 2001 A Space Odyssey for like the umpteenth time to see if they could finally figure out what, you know, what it meant. He said, we thought maybe if we're stoned, we'll get it. And so they're walking down the street bopping, and this guy comes up, pecks him on the shoulder, says, hey, brother, are you ready for Jesus? And he said, oh, man, I'm not even ready for you. But those encounters, as weird as they were, began to play into Barry McGuire's heart and mind. And he started thinking about this Jesus thing. And, and he says, and I've heard him say this, um, he said, I finally thought about, why is it when people curse, they always use the name of Jesus or God? You never, never hear somebody say, well, Buddha, or Moses, or Confucius. It's always Jesus, or God, blank, blank. And he said, I started thinking about, maybe there's something about that name, that there is some force out there that wants to associate that with profanity, to demean that name. And thinking about that is what eventually led to him becoming a Christian. And thinking about that was because somebody pecked him on the shoulder and said, hey, brother, are you ready for Jesus? Now, I mean, that's not my gig. That's not what I do. God calls some people to that. God saved Barry McGuire, and he ended up being one of the early Christian, contemporary Christian musicians who ministered to lots and lots of people. God does give opportunities to evangelize, sometimes in very unusual ways. God gives us opportunities to empathize, meaning to put ourselves in the place of people who are suffering. To be able to understand and to... to empathize with, to have compassion for people in the midst of their difficulties. Physical pain, mourning and grief, any of the kinds of struggles and sufferings people go through, God gives us opportunities to empathize. God gives us opportunities to actually act, not just to feel for, but act on behalf of others. So the question we have to ask is, are we willing to take advantage of those opportunities that God brings into our life? Not beings into our life, brings into our life. 
Are we willing to take advantage of that? And again, God makes each of us different. And we, we have natural inclinations and abilities that, that vary. But when God brings the opportunities to you, it's because He has prepared you to deal with those. Are we ready for that? We then talked about stewardship of tangible resources. Sometimes this thing goes wacky. Um, that is the biblical stewardship of money and material possessions. The biblical view requires that we have a very different understanding of and relationship to money and material possessions than the whole rest of the world. Everybody else says, this is what's important. This is what will make you happy. This is how you keep score. This is how you know your life is a success. We do not believe that. And we have to understand that when we talk about money and material possessions, our economy, quite literally, is different than somebody who is not a follower of Jesus. We believe that generosity is one of the primary ways that Christians can show evidence of the Spirit in their lives. For one reason, it's one of the primary ways we can show it is because it's so foreign to the rest of the world. If somebody really is that kind of generous, and very, with very few exceptions, and there are some exceptions, it is because of an act of the Holy Spirit. And it may be even for those who, haven't, who have not met Jesus yet, when they show generosity, that may still be an act of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit touches the hearts of people who are not yet believers. That's how they become believers. And sometimes I think the Holy Spirit touches the hearts of people who are not believers in other ways. I believe the Holy Spirit was involved in Bill and Melinda Gates, deciding that they were going to try to do all of the things that they're doing. And I think I've heard, you've heard me say that the first year that they founded the Gates Foundation, one-third of all the charitable giving on the planet came from the Gates Foundation. All right? I believe the Spirit was invested in, involved in that. And not too long ago, Bill Gates, somebody asked him if he believed in God, he said, you know, I look around at everything in the world and how it fits together and works, and I think it's very hard not to believe in God. Okay, that's a start. How much we have is not important. What we do with, or how we invest what we have, is very important. The widow's mite, the two copper pennies, less, worth less than a cent in, in our economy, didn't make a huge difference physically. Spiritually, it was very significant. She became an example for the last 2,000 years of what it means to give sacrificially, even if you have very little. So, enjoy things, but don't cherish them. And the adage that I gave you, don't ever love anything that can't love you back. Don't love your house, don't love your car, don't love your you know, record collection, don't love anything that can't love you back, your, your stock portfolio, your bank account. Enjoy them, don't cherish them, don't love them. Share things joyfully and not reluctantly. It should not be like, like, for, like pulling teeth to get you to give to the needs that exist, to the things of, of the kingdom, God's work, or to the people who have needs. God loves a cheerful giver, we're told. And the only way you can, you can get to be that way, the only way you can get to the place where you, you give cheerfully, is by practice. Practice, practice, practice. The more you give, the more natural it will feel, and the more you will be able to do it joyfully. Some, when you start, it requires an act of the will. Why? Because exactly what we said earlier, that this is contrary to the whole way we've been taught, the whole way the world works. And so we have to train ourselves to it. Think like a pilgrim, not like a settler. We talked about that earlier, of course. And that means don't think, I've arrived. I'm planting roots. I'm going to sink my pilings deep because this is where I'm going to be forever. We're not going to be here forever. You may live here until you die, but God has another place for you, so you're not home yet. And we always have to remember that. We always have to be prepared for that. We always have to have a go bag. You know what a go bag is? I used to have one when I was director of international liaison with World Vision. Um, a go bag is you've got everything in it you have to have so that if you've got to go, you can grab it and go. Doesn't mean that was the only thing I owned, but I knew that there would be times when I had to be ready to leave right away. Well, that may be the case for us. So are you, are we ready to share our money and material possessions with God and with others? And lastly, the stewardship of influence. That means using our relationships, using our contacts, using um, the the ability we have to communicate with, to convince, to influence other people of all kinds, family members, neighbors, people in our bridge club, whatever, whoever else it is, 
And there are three primary objectives that we need to understand in our stewardship of influence. One, and this is like a first step, influencing people to know the one true God. That's why I said about Bill Gates, well, saying that it's hard to believe that there's not a God when you look around. That's a start. Okay. Sometimes we start simply by helping people understand the belief in God is a very reasonable thing. Secondly, influencing people, the next thing, to believe in and follow Jesus Christ, that He is God Himself, and that it is by Him that we have a full and fulfilling relationship with God. And thirdly, influencing people to live a normal, quote-unquote, and productive Christian life, that normal Christian life, from Watchman Nee, the idea that it is balanced, it is spiritual, and righteous, as God calls us to live. That's normal for a Christian. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we ready to use our influence to bring others, I keep putting in an E instead of an R, I don't know what my problem is typing, bring others to God and to Jesus. Now, just believing in God is not enough. Don't misunderstand me there when I say that's step number one. The book of James says, you, you say you believe in God, you do well. The demons believe and they tremble. But in my experience, quite often, this was the case with C.S. Lewis, he had to finally decide he believed there was a God before he was in a position to then decide that Jesus was God's son and to believe in him and have a relationship with him. Now, Lewis became a theist, a believer in God, I think it was a year and a half before he actually became a Christian. And that was the first step for him. It is for many, many people. Because if they start out with believing there's no such thing as a God of any kind, the jump from there to believing in Jesus, unless, unless the Holy Spirit, and He can and He does, does a, a, an extraordinarily miraculous work in somebody's life, usually, in my, in my knowledge and experience, there are steps involved. And so that's why we talk about this one. Stewardship of influence. Any questions about any of that? This is a summing up, but it's a recognition that in each one of these aspects of our life, God calls us to something. God desires for us to use these things to His will and to His glory. And so we need to recognize that good stewardship, good life stewardship as Christians, means we have to, we have to be intentional about these things. They don't happen by accident. Questions, comments? Do you want to go ahead and take the test or do you want to take a break first? Okay, questions, yeah. Okay, but it's not exactly on this. No, that's fine. Okay, you know, God owns everything. Um, I was talking to somebody about this, and they're saying, well, so atomic bombs, you know, weapons of mass destruction, he owns all that too. And I was thinking, well, I mean, obviously he owns the components and, and, and all of this, right. but they were trying to say, well, God owns the bad too. Well, why are those things bad? Well, because they're ungodly. They destroy people. Right. I mean, but they're bad because we took humans took things that existed and we put them together in ways that perhaps they should have been put together and we use them in ways that they perhaps shouldn't be used. That doesn't, you know, God is the owner of all the materials. God is the owner of everything. How we use them is not the same issue. It's not the same question. You know, um, I, I, can, I can take the things of God. I mean, I can take I can take the Word of God and I can damage someone with it. So I can use that as an, as an evil weapon. That doesn't mean that everything doesn't still belong to God. It just means we sometimes take the things that God has created and given us. I mean, all the materials that are probably used in, in an atomic bomb, the, the various kinds of materials, aluminum, uh, you know, whatever else it is, all the uranium. Uranium is used to cure cancer. I mean, any pieces of those things which God made and belong to God, we can then take them and bend them, bend them to a wrong use. So we can't blame God for that. Is that fair? Absolutely. Okay. Good. Did you have another one? No, I didn't. Okay. Lynn? I'd just like to add to what you're saying to Chris is Chris's statement about being bad. Um, it's bad in our eyes, the eyes of the beholder, the human eyes, but in God's eyes, is it bad? We don't know how that incident, whether it's a bombing of a building or an earthquake that destroys the building, how that incident fits into God's plan. Right. We have to have the faith and the knowledge that supports that faith and 
you believe that we're looking at this with our eyes and then we ask, what can we do about this? Right. And, and it's true that even what appear to be meaningless acts of evil by evil people, God can redeem those as well. Now, in fact, the question of weapons of mass destruction and atomic bombs almost affirms the idea that God owns everything and that, therefore, we have a responsibility to it. The fact that we take natural things that God has given us in the world and we use them for evil purposes is exactly a violation of that principle. That God owned it, we take it, and without acknowledging Him and His ownership, without using it in right ways, we take it and pervert it and use it for horrible things. Which is actually a negative, you know, it, it proves the point by its negation, if you understand what I mean. Okay. Any other questions or comments? John? Just a quick comment on this um, um, stewardship of commitment. You know, commitment is such an ugly word for most of us. It's just a, it's just an ugly word in, in, into general pockets. I agree. We, we don't like that. But I think the key there is you were talking before you got the commitment. You were talking about what is the fountain of your satisfaction. And we were designed, we were wired to live outside of ourselves. Right. We were made that way. We'll never be content with what we have, what we are. We're wired for something beyond that. Right. And that something is someone. And I would suggest that's God himself. Y'all right. And when we genuinely see him as the fountain of our satisfaction, then the pursuit after that satisfaction reduces commitment to a joyful journey. Right. I mean, it's just a, it's like if I run after what pleases me, the commitment is no longer a heavy yoke. It's not a heavy weight. If you are pleased by the right things, the things you should I, I, be pleased I, I by. I point back to God. Yep. Because if you run after Him as the source of your satisfaction, the mere fact that you're running after Him would define how you run and where you run and, and what you're doing. Right. And would make that, I think that's what Jesus was talking about, but He said, take my yoke upon you. It's, it's, it's easy. My weight is easy. And, 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 and that turns the run into something. Yeah. Martin Luther said, love God and do as you please. Now, that doesn't mean love God and then sin however sure. you want. If you get it in the right order, if you love God, then what pleases you will be the things that are pleasing exactly. to God. Exactly. And, and you're exactly right. I mean, that's true. If, if we have our orientation right on all of these things, if the desire is for us to use all of these things to God's glory and in fulfillment of His will, then they will, we will find satisfaction in those things. But the world doesn't get that. Um, any other questions or comments? Do you want to go ahead and take the test?